Welcome to the Autosportradio.com 2020 show. I'm your host, Don K. We are live from Gilvery Speedway, 30th and High School in the beautiful town of Speedway, Indiana. Let me remind you, should you come into the town for any reason, you got to come to McGilvery. It's only about two miles straight west of Indianapolis Motor Speedway. they got great food, great servers, and the adult beverages are ice cold. Tonight's show is presented by Honda and Honda HPD, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the NTT IndyCar Series, and SRA. Founded in 1993 to spearhead Honda's entry into IndyCar racing, Honda Performance Development has overseen successful racing efforts at all levels of the sport, from karting and quarter midges to IndyCar and prototype sports cars. HPD offers race engines and competition products for professional, amateur, and entry-level racers. For more information about HPD and the company's racing product lines, please visit hpd.com. A couple things to mention quickly. In case you were uh, glued to the television to watch the uh, first open practice of the year, sorry, so did I, and it was raining and cold. But of the 11 cars that did uh, give times fastest for the day, Renus VK, second, Joseph Newgarden, Max Chilton, Alexander Rossi, Scott Lof McLaughlin, Will Power, Connor Daly, Sebastian Bourdais, Alex Palou, uh, Oliver Askew, and Felipe Nisar. Now they're talking, they're going to run tomorrow, but there was talk that they might stay through Thursday, but I, I, did, I wasn't on long enough to see that. You have a computer problem, which I do for quite frequently. We have a new computer guy at A Plus Affordable, the computer doctor, Steve Freeze. Give him a call if you got a problem. Can't get there, he'll get to you. 317 328 0766. And everybody's favorite doctor's appointment, the dentist. Go to the best, the Indy Dental Group, Dr. Jack Miller, Dr. Liz Lewis, have a phenomenal practice. Give him a call, make an appointment, 317 846 61. 25 and if you want to find out what these guys and gals enjoy and love about racing indy cars go for a ride in the indy racing experience two-seater go to online to indyracingexperience.com find a date that'll work for you and in the promo box put of all things dk1 you get a 50 percent discount or you can call shonda at 317-243-7171 and tell her dk1 and hope she doesn't hang up on you um, I also want to mention that, uh, whoops, the wrong one. And if you're looking for a vintage car or you have one and want it restored, there's only one place to go. It's a complete stop at the uh, Grand King shops. They can rebuild the engine for you. They can rebuild the car. They can do it all. Call them up. If you're looking for a car, they have a couple. Or if you have one and you need it restored, call the Grand King shops. The number is 317 820 3595. Now, my two guests are here this evening. I pleaded, cried, got on my knees, begged. They had an announcement today, which I think you'll find very interesting there. Uh, Sarah, who, who, by the way, Sarah Fisher's here tonight. <laughs> and the guy that started all of the O'Garas in the mo motorsports world, Andy O'Gara, is here with his wife, Jean. Johnny. Well, Johnny O, yeah. <laughs> Um, they're kind of going back to the grassroots of racing and how a lot of guys get started, and pe girls for that matter. I had a, a young man there today who's 12 years old, and if you saw him on television, there was a was on the news this evening, I think on six, I believe it was. Um, this kid is a, is a college kid. I'm telling you, he's really sharp. His name is Elliot Cox, and I said in another 10 or 12 years, you can come on the program. <laughs> He's 12 years old, and we're going to talk about what they're doing and the people behind it. It's called uh, SFH Racer Development, Sarah Fisher Hartman Racer Development, and they're going to work with this kid. And as you'll find out from Andy, they've been watching a long time and really found this kid good. So we're going to talk about it. Please welcome with us tonight, all the way from Kansas. He couldn't wait to get here. I can tell you that right now. Uh, in the oil business, but he's a guy who made a call when he heard Sarah had a problem with a sponsor, and about seven calls later, they finally called him back. <laughs> he thought it was a joke. He thought I was calling, and it wasn't the truth, but came in, and since then, he's been hooked on the sport, and he's around, and he's involved with them in Whiteland. Glad he's here tonight. Please welcome Mr. Wink Hartman. 
And the young guy sitting next to him, when I first saw him, he was in a midget. Not He wasn't a midget, he was in one. Then he went to becoming a mechanic, and then he became a crew chief, then he became a team manager. Now he and his wife own Speedway Indoor Karting. With Mr. Hartman, they now also own Whiteland Raceway Park. What they're doing with this young man is amazing. I'm glad to hear him here tonight. Please welcome Mr. Andy O'Gara. Can I call you Wink? Please do. Okay, Mr. Hartman. Do um, <laughs> you ever sit back to yourself and say, if I hadn't made that phone call seven times, I wouldn't I be here? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it really is a very interesting story. I was watching ESPN uh, one Saturday morning with the dogs, a cup of coffee, you know, deciding what big thing I was going to do on that particular Saturday. A story about Sarah Fisher and a sponsor dropped out, etc. And at the time, uh, I didn't know Sarah Fisher, let alone much about IndyCar. But I was kind of disappointed that that happened to somebody at such a late date. Anyway, long story short, I get Google, I start emailing, trying to figure out how I can, you know, get in touch. And I emailed, no response. I emailed, no response. I finally said, I'm going to send you money, no response. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't want to send money because these people aren't with a full deck. <laughs> I'm, I'm offering free money. But it, long story short, uh, Sarah finally got tired of the emails and thought, well, if he's crazy enough to mail money, let's see what happens. And so sure enough, uh, money popped into her account, and uh, I went to my first 500, and I present myself in front of you this evening, thanks to the O'Gara family for getting me stuck with this, uh, probably forever. It's, it's a sport that I just dearly love. Now, you were telling me today that uh, Hartman Oil has been around 100 years. Uh, 100 years this year. So, uh, you know, a little facelift here and a tuck there, I did pretty good. <laughs> we got to talk about that when you leave. I need some help there. So maybe <laughs> yeah, well, afterwards, we'll yeah. I'll share some numbers. Okay. Um, any connection between the oil business and racing? Uh, the, you know, seriously, there really is. An awful lot of my friends say to me, like, gee, don't you like to go to Las Vegas or don't you like to do all of these things where you, you know, you gamble? Uh, and quite frankly, I don't enjoy going. I, I enjoy Vegas, but I don't enjoy gambling because I get out of bed every morning in the oil business and I gamble hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and find oil. So that's, that's my lifestyle is to gamble in the oil business. Well, then I found another uh, a drug, if you will, of choice. Uh, Andy and Sarah O'Gara, they, they have the same power of drawing you in. And all of a sudden you wake up and you realize that, well, gee, we have a beautiful car. We have a beautiful shop. Uh, gee, we've now found an up-and-coming driver. So, yes, racing is gambling, but yet it is an educated gamble. Because when you have professionals like Andy and Sarah and the team he's put together, uh, the gambling is very, very small, and the opportunity is very, very large. Something I just read recently, and I've heard this for 60 years that I've been around, uh, want to become a millionaire? Start with 10. Oh, a millionaire real quick on the racing side. So I've never got into racing. I didn't have the 10 to start with. So I don't well, it's, it's, it costs money to go racing, but I think a lot of the fans here know there's, there's many, many levels of racing. You know, just like uh, the development uh, we're into today with uh, Elliot. Now that's F4. Well, that's a completely different price tag than, you know, going to the bricks and, and seeing what you can do in the big cars. So we're going to take Elliot going to increase uh, his, his workload, if you will, under Andy's direction. Then we'll decide, uh, you know, where to place him, make sure we are very, very careful that he is successful. Because uh, I've spent quite a bit of time with this young man already, and it is hardly comprehend his, his intelligence uh, on and off the track. And it's very, very rare uh, to find somebody like that. We have, I think we found a, another diamond. We're really excited about developing him. Andy, what's, what's your plan? I mean, you went through it today, but you're going to start this young man out so he doesn't scare himself to death to start with and gets comfortable in the car. And what you guys are going to put him in an F4 is completely different than what he's been in before. Yeah, I mean, we've got big aspirations for him, but I don't think uh, anything's too uh, lofty at this point. I, I feel really good with where we're at. Um, the first time... You know, we got through the season, our first full season at Whiteland Raceway Park this year, and his parents hit me up a few times about sitting down with them in the off season and uh, really trying to 
not even with SFH at the time, but trying to help them lay out a game plan. And uh, and I, you know, kept Wink clued in, and we, you know, we talked about little things here and there. And um, our first dinner, I think, got delayed uh, for the next week. I had a sick kid or something, and then, you know, hey, <laughs> this is what we're doing. Well, the more we got, uh, we ended up having dinner with their entire family, with uh, with Elliot and his sister Isabella and his his mom Amanda, his dad Travis, and um, you know, by the time we left there, it was uh, kind of one of those stories, like Wink talks about, where it 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 tugs at your heart, like this this kid is the real deal. We have opportunity in front of us right now, and it's it's I don't want to say that it's easier to find money in the lower car ranks obviously it's a lot lower do dollar figure but you have a lower piece to sell as well um, but regardless I wasn't willing to take that opportunity to anybody else I believe that we can do it ourselves and we can do it better and we can win with this kid and and um, just I just fell in love with him on and off the racetrack and I knew as soon as Wink and Libba met him and his family that they would they would feel the same I just you know we don't stick our necks out for everybody and um we have a lot of good kids come across the path but um the fact that a kid's so well connected on and off the racetrack from you know just clean cut american kid well groomed at his at his house and um you know parents who have have raised him right from an educational standpoint his um drive for dyslexia standpoint um I mean, dad, my dad tells one of the best stories, but one of the very first time we met the Cox family, um, we were in a in a race weekend in a practice session, Yamaha Junior Can, one of our most competitive classes, one of the classes that Sarah and I probably had the most fun with growing up. And Elliot's, he's a rocket. He's just annihilating everybody that day. But he came through a local yellow, and he didn't he didn't lift. And we got people on the racetrack clearing a scene well before he ever got there he's lapping him or whatever but my dad was happened to be working one of the main gates and looked over there and he's like you're gonna get somebody hurt that's not cool you need need to go talk to that kid i i didn't have to go talk to him his his dad had his foot in his butt before i could get over there and my dad's like that's a good family that's a good guy that's a good kid and uh before the end of the session he was over apologizing to our corner workers and i mean um just a just a great kid on and off the racetrack a kid that deserves a break and it's not too often that you can see that vision that young and um we're just excited for the next couple of years we're gonna we're gonna test him six eight times this year uh, probably get out a, a combination of putnam park and and irp and uh, mid ohio um autobahn uh, and hopefully get down and and maybe catch uh, coda at the end of the season that's one of the beautiful things with what f4 has done we can virtually participate in the national fia race weekends up until the race with a kid that's not yet of age um, so we'll probably take advantage of, of maybe one of those days and then uh, hopefully go concentrate on the on the winter series um, in the in the winter time November December and go down and see uh, see Wink and Libba and some sunshine and palm trees and hopefully be ready to compete is that where you get oil in the winter is down in Florida uh, they have a lot of oil down there in certain locations and you just have to be very careful to sneak mm -hmm. up on it in Florida very, very rare species down there. Now, what impressed me, among other things, with this young man is the list of sponsors he's got now. Amazing. But when you listen to him and talk to him, smoke, he's how old? 12. Yeah. Good grief. They showed a picture of him at eight. He hasn't changed much. <laughs> Not a whole lot taller. But I think, you know, the thing that I think he has in his corner is who and Sarah. Your experience and I can remember in fact I commented to her one day I was watching a midget race I think it was I think Winchester it might have been IRP and I said to her dad you know it doesn't wobble like a lot of cars in a midget midgets move smooth and he said hold it the quickest way to get from point A to point B is a straight line boy she did so now got that help and with you this kid's gonna go and what's the dyslexia part that's a big part of what he does and what he has done with it. It's quite yeah. interesting. I mean, b back to your your first statement there. I think when we sat down at their house for dinner that night, we finished dinner. Um, their parent, his parents, were very inquisitive about how to go about it and the next steps and everything. But Sarah and I left there saying, "Just keep doing what you're doing." Like they had built some beautiful marketing proposals on Elliot and showed what he had done on and off the racetrack. 
um, and establish these relationships with these partners growing from a $30 partner to a $30,000 partner over the course of these last few years and taking him locally, regionally, and nationally and showcasing his talent on the go-karting level um, and really hadn't changed their outlook um, or their personalities or their approach. And it was like, you guys are doing everything right. Um, we, we just want to help you get to the next step. Just don't lose focus. Don't, you know, keep him in a go-kart. Keep, keep him wherever you can on any given race weekend. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to show. And uh, the dyslexia piece, uh, Elliot has dyslexia, and he had multiple uh, situations growing up where, you know, the, the learning piece was challenging for him. And he was called dumb and, and, and stupid multiple times. And he said, you know, that once they had it all diagnosed, um, you know, and... and he had his tutors and their methods about going about it. Elliot is a incredibly bright individual. And, um, and I think uh, what God has given him has allowed him to focus his talents inside the car, and it will show in these big cars. And what he's done, uh, just very similar to what his hero, Justin Wilson, did with the billboards that we all saw around the city years ago with him um, promoting uh, Dyslexia Institute of Indiana and and also national campaigns um, has been phenomenal. I think uh, the last two years he's held benefits at SIK where, you know, Sarah and I don't do a whole lot. We donate a portion of the carting back, give them the room for free, try to help them with a break on the food and, you know, whatever we can do. And I think the kids raised almost $80,000, $77,000, that he's donating back to help these kids in different situations get the tutors and help that they need um, and prove uh, the legitimacy behind some of these methods um, that they've developed the last few years and bring some light to those situations. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, going into the uh, SCCA F4, the guy that most of us probably here have heard of that's the commander in chief of it now, something like Scott Goodyear. I don't think he's in the tire business. Scott Goodyear now is charge of the F431, I believe. Yeah, and I saw the car. Pictures of the car. That's a pretty nice looking car. Or he's already got a sponsor. I thought that was pretty nice. I'll come. I forget. Um, for you to have had coffee on a Saturday morning, looked up how to get a hold of Sarah Fisher and Sarah Fisher Racing and Try and say here, here I am, and nobody responded. Surprised at where you are still today. Well, in a lot of ways I am, but really I'm not. Uh, I played polo for forty some years, and polo is an individual sport, but yet it takes a bunch of people behind the scenes, in the barns, horse trainers, uh, veterinarians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be successful in that particular sport. Well, I found out very, very quickly, uh, gee, in a matter of months, quite frankly, that. IndyCar and the family atmosphere that Sarah and Andy had presented to Libba and I was not only rare, but very, very unique in a lot of ways. Uh, it takes a lot of people, if you will, behind the scenes uh, that are in the garage, that are working on the cars, the engineers, the mechanics, that uh, very rarely, you know, they get a cold pizza, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and say, keep working. But if you don't have the family atmosphere, and you don't have the, the teamwork that I was provided from day one. Very, very difficult in any car or any other business or sport to succeed. You've got to have the right people. They have to be dedicated. And they have to care as much as the guy in the seat does. It is important to them that he goes around faster than the others. Well, what is so neat of what we have now is I get another shot at, at the golden ring with a, with a young man called Elliot Cox. We have the same environment, we have the same family here. So now we're going to incorporate Elliot into my newfound family. And I think uh, between my age and his age and his hair gel and my gray hair, <laughs> you know, I think there's an opportunity someplace in between for somebody to make it in this deal. Speaking of hair gel, I was looking, I think it wasn't raining when I came in here. I thought maybe water he tidied up. Oh, um, really? so something interesting with the polo. Hair, 
one that really stuck out at Marion. Veterinarian costs as much as them. Cost a crew to look at a car. Veterinarians are not cheap. Well, but you, but you got the, the veterinarian horses. I mean, if you have a horse that obviously is not performing at its best, or you're not taking care of the animal properly for its safety, well, same thing. It's there is no difference. You call it a veterinarian. You call it the head mechanic, the head engineer. It's the same difference. You do not want to put a driver in a car that is. I think it maybe might work if the chip doesn't fail. You know, th th those kind of words, you know, there's a TV commercial about okay. It's just not okay. Well, in racing especially, it can't be just okay or it can't be just, I think we'll be able to get 10 laps or I think we'll make it till the next stop. That's not the way it works. You have to have people willing to make the tough decisions. Make sure your driver is taken care of at all times. That's number one. You know, winning and all the other things will come. But you have to have the right vet, the right mechanic and engineer, and you can be successful at this sport. So that's what we plan on doing. I, I, yeah, I was really impressed with the young man. What he said, what he, what his plan is. Also, I asked the question: Is your mom behind this? No. <laughs> yeah. She watched the with race, not when I qualify. Back in the back. One day I got up, so I, and I could hear when I'm racing. I can hear screaming. Believe it or not, I can hear. And one day he had a wreck and he got on his head. Lay down, he said, screaming. <laughs> but the family seemed behind it. I talked to the grandparents. They I think it's a great idea. I mean, the whole thing working out. And in my opinion, your dad's been around for a long time, so I know he's still got some ideas. They still work. Sarah, behind you on the right path I don't I can't think of any young kid together work his way up and what he needs to succeed good choice on his part wife think about this all into it it's very very interesting uh, my wife uh, God bless her grew up in uh, around the race cars of NASCAR and she was drug off to the 600 one time with her father and uh, found it well we'll call it distasteful uh, <laughs> So, you know, never to be seen at a track again. I mean, that was her first and last and ever, ever going. So anyway, uh, I didn't bother to tell her I wired the money until it was gone because I figured I'd get a couple of eyebrows raised and a couple of what are you doing and I'd be in the garage all night and et cetera. So I kind of forgot to mention it until everything was kind of taken care of. So anyway, I said, oh, oh, by the way, dear, there's a thing called the 500 we're going. And she's kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, she was, you know, but, you know, being... Good wife. She goes, I'll go and support whatever you've got yourself into. So anyway, off we go to the 500. Well, we got her through the gates and Ann and Sarah. And anyway, we got the family atmosphere we have, the fun we were having. And I think it took me about 30 minutes to, to say, how are we doing? And she's off with Sarah in the cart. And they're, I don't know. I mean, they're going shopping. I don't know what they're doing. So she became as hooked to IndyCar racing, seriously. In the first couple of hours at her first 500, and, and she's, I mean, she's at the front of the line every single time. Where are we going? What are we doing? And we'll be going to a lot more races, of course, without it. But uh, we'll be at the 500 this year, et cetera. So, uh, no, the wife is just as crazy as I am. And, and probably more competitive. She's on the IndyCar side. When we finish practices and we, you know, we're very fortunate over our span to compete with the best and, and, um, the two of Wink and Libba are two people that truly believe that we could beat Penske and Ganassi in the modern era. Um, but when we didn't, Libba was the first person to say, what is going on out there? Like, what do you, what do you need now? Like, we got to fix this. She was as competitive as anybody I've ever met in the sport. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't show up at the racetrack just to be there. And we don't intend to with anything moving forward. Yeah, being at the racetrack. Speaking of being at the racetrack, uh, moved rather quickly once you took over at Whiteland. And I remember you telling me after it was announced that you had purchased it. I said, well, you're going to put garages? No, that'll be next year. That was about 20 minutes later. There they are pounding. Are uh, you going to take the clubhouse down, which is around for a while? No, no. Next thing you know, there's a clubhouse. And I said, if you still got that wall that Harry Lee built, he was so proud of his mind's a wall. 
took it forever to get that thing wouldn't fall apart yeah so how how is whiteland doing i mean you brought it back to life as far as i can see i've been out there once and i went good grief whiteland is is our baby is uh and it we're so lucky to have wink and libba in that project as well um and uh, and so you know so sad to have been able to only share pictures and videos up to this point they did make it through the construction phase last year saw the garages going up um and saw the facility after the initial you know four or five months improvements uh but we had the privilege of taking them out there today which was um just as rewarding as as honestly as bringing elliot um, excuse me it was cold <laughs> Very, very cold. I didn't give any Kubota rides. We did stay in the vehicle for the track lap. So, um, no, it has been our privilege to have the opportunity to look after Whiteland and make sure it's here for the next generation of hopefully uh, my kids. And um, it's just been a, it's a it's a labor of love when we leave work or when summertime comes around and we stay down there and work a day or two a week. It's it's fun for us right now and. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things versus IndyCar racing, it's a pretty small investment for Wink and I considering everything. And it's just, it's it's neat to see, I still go back to that day when we took our kids in hand to announce at the previous driver's meeting that we were taking over and there's like 12 people and Sarah is like rubbing her forehead like, what the hell did you just do? And, um, you know, we we told those guys at that driver's meeting that we were shutting the facility for six weeks to virtually bulldoze where we needed to to get it back to where um, it, it, it deserved to be. And that very first race back to have 169 carts entered. And um, I was I was sharing with Wink and Libba some of the proposals that we worked on this off season. We pitched 12 outside sanctioning bodies from the World Karting Association to Cup Karts North America to Margay Ignite, um, Southern Indiana Racing Association, Ohio Valley Racing, Ohio Valley Karting Association, um, multiple, multiple. And I'm, there was 12 that we pitched. We won nine of the venues wow. to get those races back to Whiteland. And it's the very first time in my lifetime since my parents have been taking me down there to watch since the late 80s that there's ever been a World Karting event there. We, are you guys uh, got a team and competing against Mark Dismore and his, his? No, that's the beauty of it. Like Mark is a is a great friend. Uh, my dad was his crew chief in 1996 on his return to Indy after his big one. Um, Mark has given Sarah and I as many opportunities as anybody. Supports our kids very much. We have a schedule that does not conflict with theirs on a club basis. We work together. We understand the health of the karting community in the Midwest and the state of Indiana. Um, the biggest challenge we have right now is uh, Mark chose to go with a different tire this year. We stayed with Bridgestone because of our relationship with Bridgestone Firestone. Um, it's been, you know, they've been some of our biggest supporters over the years. and. Uh, it's a little challenging on the local racer side, but I think once we get that sorted, it'll work itself out. You might have to run a different tire here than you do there, but there's lots of opportunity. There's lots of manufacturer support. Um, there's good money. We'll have the Brian Clausen Memorial again. Um, we'll have multiple solid opportunities throughout the year. And uh, Mark's, like I said, Mark's been nothing but supportive. A phone call away, working on different campaigns that we can do together. We're talking about a triple crown that goes between uh, Whiteland Raceway Park, Newcastle Motorsports Park, and uh, G&J in Camden, Ohio. So we would have a triple crown um, that, to complete that. Now, when I was at uh, the announcement, uh, press thing you had today, uh, I went over and said hello to, to Sarah. So somebody, uh, Johnny or, or your mom, was said, uh, it's been up three days. I said, really? Worried about Whiteland? No, I got a sick kid. Huh. Been there, they've done that one. Um, but are your kids interested in what you're doing? Have they got an, I mean, I know your brother is, obviously. Kyle does, doesn't race as, probably as much as he'd like to, but... Or maybe you will starting now, I don't know. But are your kids interested in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Danny, our five-year-old, he's he's at home with the croup right now, but he is our diehard racer. Um, he, 
I went down for the week with my dad and Kyle, the Chili Bowl, with our development team down there as well. Ran three cars down there, and Sarah would send pictures of Danny every night laying on the bed with his chin in his hands until he passed out watching Chili Bowl. Like, <laughs> die hard, everything. If, if motorsports is on TV, he wants to watch it. If he's got a racing game on PlayStation, he's playing it. He's, I've sent Wink and Libba videos of him on the karting simulator, and every day he gets home, I mean, it's a, he's our challenge. He's our Henri one of always wanting to go to the racetrack. I mean, ev on you from the time he wakes up to the time he goes to bed. And our daughter, she she's unbelievable, too. She... She loves, she'll have days when she's as powerful and as, as uh, forceful as Danny on that side. And then she'll have days when she just wants to be a young little girl. And we've, she went to camp this year. There's a lot of people that say, oh, you, you push your kids. We push our kids too hard into motorsports. Well, Zoe chose camp on the only doubleheader weekend that we had this year. And we went with camp. So just to prove to everybody that we don't push our kids there, it's up to, it's up to them. And, and um, in the end, look, if she doesn't want to do it, she's going to save me a lot of money and probably make a lot more money. So um, it's all good. I, my, my kids love it. We are very fortunate to be in the position that we're in. Got to show Wink and Libba our garage for the kids today. And they said, Jesus Christ, whose go-karts are these? There's stuff everywhere. I'm like, that's that's my kids and my nephews. Like, they uh, on race weekends, they are our focus. And we were able to win quite a few races with the combination of them this year. And I think this next year is even, even bigger and brighter as we take them to Whiteland and beyond. Um, and as far as Kyle goes, we'll, we're going to support Kyle as long as he wants to do this. Um, he finished second in the National Pavement uh, Non-Wing Sprint Car Championship this year. And we've worked extremely hard on the car this winter. We're, uh, I think he leaves on Sunday to head down to Florida to run Showtime Speedway Wednesday and Thursday night tomorrow, or next week, I'm sorry. And uh, we... We firmly believe that we can go after that championship. We're committed to all the USAC Silver Crown pavement races this year, um, and we're redirecting our focus for that. And I'm sure you'll see Kyle jump in and out of this F4 car to shake it down for Elliott. He's got some rear engine experience in those cars with the F2000 and Indy Lights a little bit. So um, future's bright. He's still he's still got time, and he's still having fun and smiling. Listen, I, I have a piece of property we could put an oil well in. You got time to drill? Well, first I have to check your credentials. Oh, well, so much for that. And make sure, yeah, I mean, you got to be careful in these deals. Have you, have you been around in a cart around Whiteland yet? Um, I had one experience with Miss Fisher in, I think it was Sonoma. Uh, I probably have never admitted it to her, but I, I've still not forgiven her for... Uh, the scare factor that she created in 15 seconds of holy terror going up and down and around. And uh, I was crying like a three-year-old saying, I want out of the car. <laughs> I used to run when I, I, my a partner early on in an auto sport here in town, Harry Lee, nationally known broadcaster when he owned it. I'd go out there once and I'd say, come on, let's get in a cart. I'll give you a lap head start. Really? Off I'd go. Before I finish the first lap, here he comes. Yep. Uh, you know, there's a good reason for me not being in the seat of a race car. I can tell that already. So I'm sitting here for almost 60 years doing this. Um, you know, it, it's interesting the people that get involved and enjoy the sport of, of motorsports racing. And I, I mentioned this many, many times that you know, football teams, 11 guys on the field, one guy misses a block, the quarterback gets knocked out. Somebody doesn't do something right, doesn't put a tire on right, doesn't get the suspension right, the driver goes out, it breaks, you have a serious, far more serious problem than getting knocked out. Uh, so in my mind, it's one of the ultimate team sports because everybody has to know their job, how to do it. And it's very important, I think. Right? To me, motorsports, I, I think, is the ultimate team sport. And it starts at the top. I mean, people that are running it have to know what to do with the right people in the right spot. Everybody's got to got to do their thing. I, I'm still in the right pool. Still enjoy motorsports. I think it's exciting. I think it's thrilling. And I think IndyCar is in the right direction. They've got some good young drivers. They've got some president of the of the series is doing things the way he should. So. 
look forward to it. I hope I live long enough to see this get 12 now. You got to be, what, 18 to be an IndyCar? No, no, no. Don't forget the doctor's appointment. No, that's which they, one? Well, there's, in your case, multiple things yes. need to be. But yes. We'll work one at a time slowly, okay. and you and I'll be there together when, <laughs> yeah. uh, when Elliot, when he's, when he's kissing the bricks at 18, we'll be there. Okay. I'm afraid you might have to put wheels on a box and push me up, and I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> well, I, you know, I find it interesting of how you got involved in this. I find it interesting why, how it got your attention watching ESPN say, I've got to help this poor girl, and you did, finally. Um, and you're still here, you built a nice shop downtown, which I understand you sold now. Um, hooked on this sport. Well, I've, uh, as they say, I think, what is it, I'm an A personality. Uh, that's why Andy and I work so well together. Uh, he called me one night and, and said, gee, uh, what do you think about go-karts? And I'm going, well, yeah, I think a lot about go-karts. <laughs> and so he says, well, I got some good news. I said, we're buying a go-kart track. <laughs> I said, we are. And he says, yeah. And I, of course, knowing Andy, I'm going, whatever, send the papers. We're buying a go-kart track. And then he turns around and he goes, he takes me out there, and I'm going, oh, has he stepped in it this time? <laughs> It was, it was, uh, anyway, it was an interesting thing to call that a go-kart track back when I first saw it. But anyway, and then as we've already alluded to, uh, he's like I am. So was, the paper is uh, still wet with the ink, and we're going to do all this thing over a period of time and invest some money and do all these things. Well, 48 hours later, he's got bulldozers, he's got trucks, he's got lawnmowers. I mean, he's got an army of people trying to clean out things that have grown there for years and years and years. And, Anyway, as we've alluded to, uh, much like myself, why are we waiting until tomorrow? Because we can do it today. And so the garages are up, the new shop's up, uh, the track is in pristine condition and ready for spring if uh, Mother Nature will allow us to have an early spring. So, but that's the way we do things. Uh, you know, if you're going to be successful, you got to get out there, get prepared, get the job done, and, and put your arms around it. So we'll do the same with our development team and uh, Elliot Cox with his hair gel. We'll be, that's our big thing. I tease me. I said, someday I'm going to get some hair gel, whatever you do. I'm going to have somebody do whatever you do uh, just to get, because he's, he's a riot to work Poor with. Poor kid's going to have a complex here real soon. <laughs> uh, I told mom and dad, I said, you can only let him see me about once a week because he'll, he'll start to rub off on him. You'll, you'll think you got me at home. So you better be careful with that. But it's, a, it's an exciting time, and it's really going to be a, an exciting next few years. Well, and... and in spite of your involvement in drilling for oil, being involved with Andy and Sarah in a numerous operations, you have a stadium in Kansas. I think, did you have a soccer team or something? I forget why you built it. They wanted, you wanted to put it somewhere, and they said, no, you said, the hell with it. I'll put it out here and do it myself. Well, it's a, a short story. Uh, it's, a, it's an Andy story, quite frankly, because he would have done the same. Uh, some, somehow, somebody rang me, and I, anyway, I ended up in professional football, indoor football. Uh, which had a grand time, just like IndyCar, it's, it was a lot of fun. But I, the downtown arena that the city county owns, of course, they didn't want an outsider like me coming in and, and hogging all their fun and having yippee ki -yay days. So I got a little bit huffy, and I said, that's fine, I'll go build my own stadium. Well, they looked at me and started laughing. Uh, so I don't know, it took me about two years, and we've got, uh, I've got my, it called Hartman Arena. It was just an ingenious idea. So it's called Hartman Arena. Uh, seats 6,500 people for concerts. Seats about 4,800 for soccer and indoor football. Uh, have a grand time. You know, I get a loge box so I can see every event. It's, it's a heck of a deal. You have an owner's box? <laughs> well, quite frankly, I'm never there because I'm always out doing something else that I get stuck into. Uh, so, but my grandchildren and children are very, very pleased that, that I did what I did. <laughs> I bet they are. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I got an email from Andy and said, did you get our email about Tuesday? I have, I've been trying to get on their email list and it hasn't happened yet. So he sent it to me. I said, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. So I came in and set up quick and my IT guy back here came and finished it. I wouldn't know how to do it anyway and came down there and it was very interesting. I thought uh, I was really impressed by that young man. I gotta tell you. And the people he's surrounded by with your dad and all his experience, I'm gonna keep track of the numbers so you 
That'll be straight. <laughs> you and Sarah can work on the car and the driving instruction. This kid has got the best of everything to look forward. You're going to form. Now, get on my, I want to get on your email list. I'll, so I'll work on that. Yeah, I know. You told me that before. <laughs> but I also put, put a, a, an arm on him. I know a lot of you here have kids or grandkids. The neat thing to do is go down on a Saturday or a weekday in the summertime to Whiteland. So I've talked to them into giving me some tickets so we can send some people out and have a good time and see Whiteland. If you weren't there, haven't been there in the last 12 or 15 years, you're going to fall If you fall come, out. yeah, Friday, Saturday night race, and in the summertime, you can get on uh, racewrp.com. And it's a dollar, it's literally a dollar gate admission, and you can bring your own cooler and sit trackside for a hundred plus cart show. All the money at the gate goes to the charity of choice that week. Um, you know, we were successful in raising six, seven thousand dollars for different charities throughout the year last year, and we'll do the same this year. And and uh, it's a cheap place to go have a good time and, and see some of the next aspiring drivers come through. Well, I, I know I'm holding you up from your dinner. <laughs> what, what, what time was your res, what time was your reservation at St. Elmo's? In five minutes. Oh, I see. But don't let that no. It it won't. No hurry. No hurry. Well, I thank you both for being here. This is your second visit, and I'm uh, pleased that you were in town and have took the time to do it. Look forward to hearing good things from young man moving up. Fun to hear how he does and the progress he makes. And I know under overseeing and Sarah and Andy working with him. Work. By the way, I had Dennis here last week. I said, by the way, is is one of your crew members going to be available this year? He said, yeah, in May. Well, they're going to run two or three more races. Will he make that? Not likely. I'm not, uh, I don't know why. I mean, good grief. But uh, luck to you in the month of May. And I think you're taking mechanical genius with you, Greg. Yeah, there's a good there's a good group coming with us, and um, we're gonna do everything we can to get him that baby Borg. So, so thanks for coming in here, keeping us up to right. Wink Hartman, Andy O'Gara. Thank you very much, Don. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Now my next guest is back somewhere. I don't know, planning something or not sure what he's doing. <laughs> here he is. I hear him. If it's time for you to get insurance for your home, your car, or commercial property, do what I did, what a lot of us did. Call Mike Pardee at VP Insurance Company. They're located at 5004 West 16th Street, and they can help you out. You'll be surprised to find you get better coverage for less money. So give him a call. Tell him what you need, and he'll help you. 317-248-0070. That's VP Insurance, Mike Pardee, 317-248-0070. And if you are into vintage cars and like vintage and trans am you got to subscribe to the speed tour magazine it is top class magazine just go to svra.com and subscribe you'll love it some of the drivers that you know from when you were a kid they're still driving they get in some of these vintage cars and off they go so check it out at speed tour magazine svra.com and uh, check it out if you'd like to take a tour of some race shops, starting with the Grand King the Working Museum, uh, you can do it. You can get six to eight people, and they'll take you for a ride, tour some shops. They'll pick you up one parking lot somewhere, and they'll drop you back there. In the meantime, they'll take you to some race shops so you can see what's going on. If that's of interest to you, I think you will enjoy it. It, it starts on, it's the Grand King shops that run it. So give them a call and ask them about it. You can call Bill on his cell. He loves that. His number is 317-371-0290. That's Grand King Shops. Take a ride on their limousine. Number 317-371-0290. And if you're lucky, when you call them and you go and they get together, maybe Fluffy will be somewhere in the area and you'll enjoy it. My next guest is a gentleman that uh, I have I had the privilege of having on here a number of times. The last time he was here was at Santa Claus, and he chastised me for not having enough room for Santa Claus to fit. I hope I did it right this time. But we're here to talk about a good, good, good friend of his and a well-known and, and an iconic race driver. He could drive anything and won it, most everything he did. And between the two of them, the, with their racing for Riley, they r raised in excess of $4 million. John, as we know, passed away a little over a week ago. 
but nobody knew him better than the king. And I invited him here, and here he is tonight. Please welcome Dave, the King Wilson. Thank you. Yes. I want to start off with an O'Gara Cemetery story. Oh, did they leave? No. Oh, gone it. Okay. Oh, they're right there. Uh, the, uh, so, ex Mrs. Wilson and I, her uh, grandmother was buried <laughs> in uh, the Holy Cross Cemetery. Do you remember this? Okay. So, we go down there one Sunday or one day to, to see her grandmother's grave, and we're leaving, and we look up, and here comes this you can see a, a, a burial a, a thing. And so we, oh my gosh, let's get out of the way. So I pull over, and the next thing I know, they're all parking right around me. And, and the next thing I know, I'm like in the infield of the 500, surrounded by the O'Gara family cemetery funeral. And so we just got out and partaked in the whole thing, you know, just like we were O'Gara's. And, uh, and I always think of that whenever I go down there, but was, that was, uh, anyway. That's my fun story of the night. No, I got a couple other ones, too. Well, let's get down to why I invited you here to start with, and then we can okay. go to the, uh, the giggly part. Okay. How did you meet and connect with, with John Andretti? Well, uh, I'd met him at the racetrack and uh, doing different things at the Speedway and here, there, and everywhere. And then when uh, I got um, – I remember I was doing races on ESPN2 – when uh, Terry Lingner had that thing out at the, the velodrome, the go-kart races at the velodrome, and I was I was doing the play-by-play, -play, and John came out as a, a deal one day, a promotional deal, and we got to talking about this, that, or the other, and it was always fun because I'd always seen him at the racetrack. And then when I got my show on WIBC in the afternoon, I called him and I go, hey, will you be a weekly guest on my show? And uh, he said, sure. And so every Tuesday or – 14 and a half years, he would call in and, uh, and we would talk about what happened that, that weekend. And so, uh, which was as amazing. I mean, when he won at Martin, let me tell you the dedication to this guy, because he was loyal. Uh, when he won the, for Richard at the, Richard Petty at the Martinsville, you remember the show they used to have RPM tonight? It was on ESPN too. So he's on that show because he had won that weekend that Tuesday. Well, Tuesday's the night he called me. And so uh, I'm, we, we had that on the monitor because I knew he was going to be on. We're doing a show, and I go, oh, he's going to blow me off, or he won't be able to do it. or Not that he would blow me off, but he just won't be able to do it. So John's on there. They're talking to him. They go to commercial break, and they're saying, I know the hotline rings. And they had asked him to stay a second segment. And he goes, nope, i got to call my radio friend Dave. So he blew off TV to, to do our show. So... Uh, so anyway, he's on every week. Well, I had a producer, his name was Matt Hiblin. And Matt's job was just to be an instigator. He was, he was the jerk. We, we, when we'd have, Je when he have uh, Jeff Saturday, the Colts center on, if he ever got like a penalty on him that Sunday, Matt would have recorded it. And when I would go to introduce Jeff Saturday, he'd play a, a, the official going, holding number 63, you know. <laughs> That was just the rub it under his life. So every week, John's calling in, and, and finally, after a while, Matt started going, so what happened this week? Did you have flat tire? What happened this week? Somebody run into you? What happened this week? What's your excuse this week, loser? You know, that. So, and then John would give it right back. It was like bang, bang, bang. It was great. So finally, after a, a, a year and a half of this, I said, you know what we got to do? We just got to settle this on the racetrack. Let's just have a race, Matt versus John Andretti. And of course, man, like, I'll smoke him, I'll blow him off, all this, all that. So, okay. Well, John would, you know, would come back to Indianapolis uh, around uh, the holidays to see his family and Nancy's family. And uh, so we set it up at Stephen Johansson's out there on Lafayette Road. And I thought, here's what I thought. The whole thing was, <clears throat> people will pay money to race against John Andretti. Where else can you race in a comparable vehicle against a real race car driver. And if they do, if they'll pay for it, we ought to raise some money for charity. So that was my idea. And I said, well, who do you want to raise this for? And John says, well, I'm a, I'm a Riley guy. Let's do it for Riley. I said, okay. So the first year we go out to Stephanie Johansson's. I got Brian Barnhart to be the, uh, to be the technical guy. And, 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 of course, the whole week we're telling Matt, well, Matt, you're such a star. We're going to start you on the pole. 
And, and of course, John, he'll have to start at the back of the pack because we had sold, I don't know, 10 or 12 seats and all that money going to Riley. So Matt's, of course, like the cock at the walk. You know, hey, I'm on the pole, and I'll never see Andretti unless I'm lapping him, and blah, 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 blah. Well, right before the start of the race, I had Brian Barnhart find a problem, a mechanical problem with Matt's cart, and he got moved to the back of the field. <laughs> And John made his day a long one. <laughs> there ain't a stretch of that rail at Stephen Johansson's. That boy didn't hit. <laughs> and, and, and that's how it all started. In the first year, we raised $3,600. And uh, 2000 of that came from Gary Pettigo, and, uh, who you know used to be with uh, Panther Racing, had the Chevrolet dealership. <clears throat> and it just started. Okay, let's go. And so then it was John Andretti. It was kind of it was my idea, and I named it Race for Riley. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Why that and all that's good. But uh, John made it happen. The fact that he was John Andretti was one thing, but John could go to sponsors, and and he got because he was driving for Richard Petty and the Cheerios car, so he goes to General Mills, and we go, we want to get you involved. General Mills says, great, that sounds good. Let's get Kroger involved. Well, that's been the biggest deal. Kroger's been unbelievable because not only do they <clears throat> put the scanners in all their stores in Indiana, but once you're touched by Riley Hospital for Children, for, for, how many people here, just raise your hand, if you've, been, if you've had a family member, a, a, a relative, somebody you know that went to Riley? I mean, look around this room. Unbelievable. Look, and it's, the, and look it's, at all the hands there. Yeah. And it's just not Indiana. Uh, there have been kids that they brought over in Afghanistan that needed prob had problems. There was a little girl I met one time that lived in Los Angeles. Her, fa her family lived in L.A. They were well-to-do, and she had some rare disease, and, that, and no doctors on the West Coast could help her. And they, and they looked at it, you better go to Riley. So they fly to Indianapolis to go to Riley. So... Once you've been involved with Riley and you see how the lives they touch, it's easy to get involved. Well, what Kroger does is they bring their store managers in and give them a tour of the hospital. So all of a sudden, it's personal. And so those store managers go back, and they impart this fire. They impart this desire into their employees so that all they got to do is that you're bagging at your groceries. You know, you got a race for Riley or a Children's Miracle Network scanner there. You just go, hey, would you like to donate to Riley? That's all you got to say. And if you just do that every time and make sure you got the scanners up there. And so they're, I forget, they're three hundred, almost $400,000 a year, those scanners. So, uh, but John brought those people on. That was John Andretti. And the thing... We also, when I had my radio show, we liked doing, we were, we, I like to educate people about Riley. And so the race for Riley is just not one event. It, it would be, uh, we would have a party at Riley Hospital for the kids down in the lobby and sponsors would bring food or I remember a couple of years we were sponsored by the U.S. Army and they would make dog tags for all the kids and, and just, we just have a big party things going on. And then the kids that couldn't come down. They would take uh, gift bags, and John would go up and walk and go room to room to every room to help the kids. And so, you know, it's just not a one-day event. But I would be doing my show in the lobby, and it was I'd be talking to caregivers. I remember I talked to this doctor, Dr. Brown, that he was done, when he was done yapping with my dumb butt, he, he was going to go up and operate on a baby that was three days old that was born with three chambers in its heart. I mean, when, when, you're, when you're that close to that, it is so humbling. You hear people talk about being humble. I mean, it's so humbling and, and the miracles and the work. And I can't fathom, I'm not a parent, I cannot fathom a more helpless feeling than to have a child who's sick. And where do you get help? Who, who specializes in what they might have, a rare disease or something like that? Or you don't have the insurance. You don't have the financial means to provide for your child what a nightmare well you go to riley and no matter who you are or what you got they take care of you and they treat you and, and a lot of people don't realize this too is that yeah they, they they pay medical bills for kids but there was a couple of mothers that i spoke to this one uh, lady lived in fort wayne and her child was there and she had to drive back and forth and, and she's a single mom she didn't have any dough and so riley was giving her gas money to get back and forth 
because she had other kids to take care of. And then when they have a Ronald McDonald house uh, here, and so the mom was staying there. So Riley not only was supporting the, the child, but helping the mom get back and forth so she could see her other kids. So John, and, and, and even, even, even when it wasn't race for Riley time, even when there weren't cameras and media around, if he was in Indianapolis and he had time to kill, he would go by. And he, and it wasn't like he'd walk in and, hey, how you doing, sign a hero card and walk out. He would walk in and, because, you know, a two or three or four-year-old kid's not going to know who John Andretti is. But those parents do. And, and the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents and the cousins and the friends and the family, they know that's John Andretti that just comes in. And he would sit down with those people. He wouldn't just come in, hey, how you doing? Here's my, you know, blah, blah, blah. He'd sit down and go, what's wrong with Bobby? And then listen to the family. And they would tell him, and he would do that whether there were other people around or not. And uh, he was the greatest example of saying Maya, what well, not the greatest, but he was a, a, a fabulous example of the uh, Maya Angelou uh, quote, People will often forget what you say to them, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. And John had that way of making f people feel special. When, you know, you would go to, uh, to Riley and, and work with the kids. And, and that would come back, and I've told this story a hundred times before, but when John and Ed called me in January of 17, he goes, no, I got stage, uh, then they thought it was just stage three, cancer, colon cancer. And I don't know how much I'm going to be able to do for this year's race for Riley. And I go, well, don't, you know, we'll handle that. Don't you worry about that. But what are you going to do about it? And he goes, well, I'm still thinking I might go public. We, you know, but then he ended up, he did, you know, with the, the hashtag check it for Andretti, which was a huge success. And I've got a couple of examples of, of posts that people have sent into to Jarrett's uh, Twitter. But at one point, there was a 45-day wait to get a colonoscopy in Indianapolis. And I don't know how many people's minds were relieved or how many lives he saved by going public with that. But we had a press conference at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in May of 2017, and, and it was John's, he was getting most of his treatment in Charlotte. It was John's uh, cancer doctor here that was gonna help him here. And, and then Doug Bowles and John and Jarrett and myself, and we're talking about what the race for Riley and all that. And we got done and there was a little boy named Braden and Braden is a Riley kid. If you saw him, you'd recognize him. He's the Riley champions. And uh, he goes, John and I were done, and we're getting ready to walk away. And he says, can I talk to you? And we said, sure. And so we go over in the corner. He's in a wheelchair. And when, when Braden was two years old, John had gone in to see you there with his family and, uh, and talked to the family, Kevin and his mom, about young Braden. And then he had a, a Cheerios die cast, a 43 Cheerios die cast, and he signed it to him. And so Braden's sitting there talking, and he goes, when I was two years old, uh, you came in my room, and you gave me this car. And he pulls the car out, and, he, and I'm 12 years old now, and I've had 22 operations. And I have had this car with me at every operation, and it brings me luck, and I want you to have it. He gave it back to John. So, you know, when things like that happen, you are blessed. I mean, that was people talking, you know, we've raised between uh, race for Riley over four and a half million, almost five million dollars. And a lot of people for, yeah, well, thank you very much. But, and you don't want to forget also about the Stringer. Is the Stringer car at the museum, Marty? This is a car, John got this car in uh, 2011. And he just went around. His goal was to have as many of the living Indianapolis 500 participants autograph this car as he could. And at that time when he started, there were like 273. And I think he got over 250 autographs on there, didn't he? And, and, and I mean, there's guys that, you know, Dan Weldon's on there, Justin Wilson, Bob Hartgate. There's a lot of guys that aren't able to sign things anymore. So, that, but he they auctioned that off in May of 16, if I'm not mistaken. And he raised almost a million dollars for St. Jude's with that car. But that was him driving all around, you know, and, and making and calling and begging and finding people and, and taking the car up so they could sign it and all that. That was his effort. So his his ability to give back is, is truly amazing. Another story, and 
Uh, I told this uh, at the racers' breakfast on Saturday, but uh, there's a, a motorsports writer down in southern Indiana named Brad Winters, and Brad covered racing for these little papers down there. And he, he got a phone call from a friend of his, and that friend had a, a relative that lived in south of Kansas City, and she had an 8-year-old boy who had terminal cancer. But this kid loved NASCAR. And she was wondering if Brad could get any drivers to call, you know, any to call and communicate with him. And Brad goes, well, you know, I know John Andretti. So he called John Andretti, told him what was going on. And as it just so happens, that was it was like a week and a half or two weeks before the, Nat, the cup cars ran at Kansas City. So John goes in a day early, which you know what kind of a sacrifice that is for because, you know, you're away from your family it, all those days. So, But he leaves his family a day early, flies into Kansas City, rents a car, drives an hour and a half south of this people's house, knocks at the door. This woman and her 8-year-old son open the door. There stands John Andretti. He goes in and spends five hours with that little boy playing video games and talking and, and just had lunch with them and just being a part of their life, you know, just touching him. And when he left and, and every couple of weeks, he would, you know, he'd call the little boy and the little boy would take notes. Well, why did so-and-so run into you? Or why did you pit here? Or, you know, and, well, you know, and, and why did you do that? You know, and so John, they would talk back and forth. And when that little boy passed, John called the mom and said, do you need help with final expenses? And she said, no, no, a bunch of people have pitched in. But to show you how much he had touched that family, that mother who just lost her eight-year-old son had a 43 car engraved on that little boy's headstone, John Andretti's name on it. That's how he touched people. Um, I got to look at my cheat sheet. If I ever figure out how to use this phone, it'll be scary. Oh, it's uh, check out Don's phone. <laughs> my, fl my flip phone, yeah. You got your flip phone? Oh, yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. Uh, is that it? Yeah. You're like Andrew Luck without the skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Th thank you for noticing. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have thrown for the same yardage as Andrew Luck this year. So uh, we went on the race, grew and grew and grew, thanks to John Hard's work, hard work. And people, once they get involved, they want to participate. And uh, so uh, this is a story I don't, I don't think I've ever told before. But um, so one year, there was always a friendly rivalry between Jeff Gordon and John. And Jeff was a, is a huge supporter of Riley. But he had a, a, his foundation because he was always doing events and he was always getting donations. And so, you know, when he would come into town, he would do a bowling tournament. But then he would always decide beforehand, well, here's what I want to write the check for. All right. So, <clears throat> but he always wanted to beat us. So uh, we had a friend that was helping us and was helping Jeff Gordon. So we do our whole series of events. And I think we raised that year was 209000 and that friend says, oh, well, you know, Jeff Gordon was going to write his check for 225 So we had hoped that we were going to beat him, but we didn't. And John stops. He goes, wait a minute. Can you tell Gordon how much money we raised? Tell him we raised a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 no. Tell him $260,000. And Jeff Gordon's 225 turned into 275 <laughs> When, um, you know, his spirit was such, he was a, I mean, he was kind-hearted, but he was a feisty competitor. I, I, I told this story, too, last Saturday, and, and he, he did not like me telling this story. But I think it's a perfect example of his combativeness, his way he was on the racetrack. When he first started running cup, he's down there running, and uh, Earnhardt comes up behind him at some track somewhere and sticks him in the which Earnhardt was known to do. So the race is over. John tracks Earnhardt down in a garage, walks up to him and says, 
to ever do that again. I will purposely crash you every race until NASCAR suspends my license. <laughs> Earnhardt never dicked with him again. <laughs> That's my boy. You know, you mentioned uh, the number of people that have responded, and I saw a number of responses that guys and gals had said, if it wasn't for John, I wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't. Have, I never thought about it. Uh, and I think that was his. He never, probably, never really gave it a thought when he did. They went, oops. Well, yeah. Here's one of those comments off of Jarrett's tw Twitter. I never met your dad, but I feel he saved my life, and I'm forever grateful. 2018, at the age of 52, I saw your dad's campaign. That helped me overcome my fear and go. I had a precancerous polyp. Doc said if I'd waited, my story would be different. So that was the thing. Yeah, John, he was 53 years old before he got a colonoscopy. And it was only because Nancy harped on him. And thank God for wives who have more sense than we'll ever have. You know what I'm saying? But Because at 50, had he gone in at 50 and gotten a colonoscopy, they would have caught it. And, I mean, he's a race car driver. So, you know, every, every year since he was eight years old, he had had a complete and very thorough physical. You know how they do, especially here at Indy. And, uh, but it never included a colonoscopy. So finally, she's like, hey, you're over 50, let's go. Because it, it, with no history in your family at 50, you're supposed to have one. Men and women, by the way. And um, they found, it was, they thought they, stage three, but it turned out to be stage four cancer. He, uh, first round, had uh, 12 rounds of chemo, and then they cut a bunch of cancer out of it. And at one point, they said, you're cancer-free. And um, he was back here in January of 18, I think, and he was inducted into the Harf Hall of Fame. And uh, he called me that morning of the, of the thing, and he goes, I don't know if I can come or not. My back, I got this horrible pain in my back. I don't know what it is. It's this horrible pain. Well, he gutted it out, of course, and he goes to the Harf Banquet, and he gets inducted. And he'd flown up from North Carolina to do this. It wasn't like he was in town. And, but it turns out the cancer had come back. And it had come back into his lymph nodes and his back. And it spread throughout his body. So he went through a second 12-round regimen of chemo. More surgery to remove cancer. At one point, he told me, they have, there is cancer around my aorta. But you would have never known that way he fought and uh, they went through a another uh, experimental treatment and uh, that didn't work and so in October he was back and uh, we were at the Kroger store at 10th and Shadeland because it's the one that donates the most money every year so they, that that manager just gets her people and so we do the check presentation and media and all that kind of thing. And then John says, all right, I got to talk to you guys. And so we all go back to this room at Kroger. And it was Big Joe and I and uh, Kevin T and a couple of members of the uh, Race for Riley Mafia. That's what he called the people that were in the inner circle there that worked because once you got in, you never got out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then uh, Pam, the head of Kroger in uh, central Indiana, and a couple people from the race or from uh, Riley Hospital. And uh, so he takes us back there, and he says, I'm not going to make it. This is in October. He says, I've arranged for home hospice, and uh, I don't expect to make it through the holidays. But his message was, I want the race for Riley to continue. And he even brought it, and I remembered that. I didn't remember until he brought it up then, but... Because he asked me, he goes, what do you want to call this race when we first started it? And I said, let's just call it the race for Riley. That way, no matter who's doing it when, it'll, it's, it's the race for Riley. It's not about you or me or WIBC or Kroger. I mean, we have the Kroger name on it because they're the presenting sponsor. But it, it's the race for Riley. And he goes, I want this to go on. And so the last couple of years, he hasn't been able to drive. So Jarrett's done the driving, and he's a he is a super – Young man, if you've not met this kid, he is, I mean, you can see he and Nancy, what a fabulous job they did with them, the children. And, and Jared's the real deal. I mean, he's 
turning left and right. He's winning. He's competitive. And and I know Michael's going to help him out here. But, uh, you know, Jarrett's kind of moving in to help talk with sponsors and that kind of thing. And he goes, I want this thing to continue on. And uh, Michael had, he, and he said, he goes, had Michael not sent the plane for us, I could have never, I could not have made it up here. So I don't know how many times Michael flew John and Nancy here, there, everywhere he needed to go with his plane to accommodate uh, to accommodate John. But uh, as we all know, he uh, he fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. He told me at one point, Dave, I just need to live to 2021 because he goes, then I'll be more assured of where Jared's going to be and where my daughters are going to be. He didn't quite make it to 2021, but he made it past the holidays. Till, uh, to January 30th, and uh, I have to admit, a, um, I feel bad to an extent in that uh, I, I went to the service Thursday, and um, it, uh, Nancy and Jarrett and his daughters, Amelia and they could not have, they were pillars of strength. You can tell their faith was so strong. And I know John, had, and he was, he was, you know, he knew what was going on, and he had a very strong faith. And uh, rumor has it that Mario got him a blessing from the Pope. That ain't bad, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyhow, I, when I saw them, they were the pillars of strength. And, but then the pain in Corky and, and Aldo's face and eyes just stabbed me. It just chilled me. I mean, you know, it's never, never good for a parent. You're not supposed to bury your child, you know. And, but the pain in their eyes was just so much. And I, and I turned and I got done and I saw him and just couldn't believe. What's he doing in there? And uh, I come walking towards the back of the church, and the part that ripped me apart, there were so many of these young men and women that he had touched at Riley and stayed in touch with, and they were all coming in, and the pain in their eyes and the grief on their faces because their hero had passed on. And he wasn't a hero because he could throw a football or a basketball or hit a baseball or even drive a race car. He was a hero because he gave them something none of us can ever buy extra of, and that's time. And he would spend time, and he would show interest. And the pain in those young people's faces, I couldn't do it. And uh, so I left. But... Uh, the memories, you know, it, it's up. <laughs> Before I left, Jarrett found me, and he goes, uh, "We got to have a meeting next week, race for Riley meeting." I go, "No problem, no problem." He goes, "Yeah, we got to, we got to keep this going, or he'll be mad." <laughs> we don't want him mad, but uh, lives that he touched, and the, the lives that we can continue to touch, and the message I think that John leaves for all of us. And, and again, it goes to Maya Angelou's quote, you know, you, you can, you can help people. You can, every day we can do something for somebody that makes them feel better. That makes, makes them feel, you can be John Andretti every day. We don't have the platform John did, but you don't have to raise four and a half million dollars. You can, you know, Hey, you're look good. Or just say something, be nice. Hey, hey you're as talented as Andrew Luck. Yeah, you know, just to help. Um, yeah, you can lie. Go ahead. Yeah, you can. <laughs> but do something nice and just think of John when you do that. Because then you're just you're just you're just spreading all the love and the goodness that John Andretti brought to us. Yeah, thank you. I remember uh first uh, race for Riley we're out at and uh, in, in we're out there racing, and uh, Jarrett's running for John, and John's standing there, and 
Jared comes up and he goes, and John's asking about this one corner. Why aren't you getting through that one corner? He goes, you should be able to make that. John says to Jared, he goes, you should be able to go full throttle through that corner. Jared says, Dad, I can't, I can't get through there. And John looks at him and goes, don't make me suit up. <laughs> But I'll, um, you know, I mean, and there's a lot of people still hurting Bill Simpson. What a fabulous man, Bill. There's a lot of people hurting over him, and everybody dies. We never, none of us are making out of this alive. But, you know, when somebody touches you like John did in as many lives as he did, it, you know, it causes people to pause and reflect. And uh, I think the best we can think, uh, I can do certainly, is to uh, help Jarrett continue the race for Riley as long as we can. And if you know, you can just go be nice to somebody. If you want to make a donation to Riley, make it in John's name. Or if you, Window World, they they uh, his uh, big sponsors, Window World for he and Jarrett, and, and they help out the uh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis. You can make a donation down there in in John's name if you'd like to, or just you know this coming June when you go to if you go to Kroger, uh, pick up a scanner and donate one, three, or five bucks and. But I think the biggest thing you can do for us is just do something nice and for somebody and thanks, John, that was for you. Thank you. Now, before, before well, well, Howdy's not here, so he won't fall asleep. Before we leave, you had indicated before we got into this part, you had a couple of uh, giggles stories. Well, I did those already. Oh. Yeah, I did my big clothes earlier. I'm sorry, Don. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do want to leave with a joke joke. Uh, I, I can't leave on a downer here. So this is my favorite new joke joke. You ready? All right, here it is. Guy's got a horrible toothache, so he goes see the dentist. The dentist looks in his mouth and says, oh, we're going to have to pull that tooth. But he goes, don't worry, man. He goes, I'll shoot you up with some Novocaine. You won't feel a thing. Guy goes, oh, no, no, no. I'm allergic to Novocaine. If you shoot me with Novocaine, I'll get highs all up and down my body. Dennis says, no problem, I, we'll, we'll give you gas. You know, that'll, and then guy goes, no, 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 no. If, if you do that, I'm, I, I, I get nauseous and I'll throw up over everything. Dennis says, okay, then I'll give you a Viagra. <laughs> guy goes, a Viagra, will that help with the pain? The dentist says, no, but you'll have something to hold on to when I'm yanking that tooth out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you do stand up around town at all? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, doing. Sh I think they're all. I'm doing shows uh, Thurs next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday up at Sullivan's Valentine's Day, and, and they're doing two shows up there and with the train and everything. Then uh, the uh, next Thursday, I think the twentieth, I'm at the White River Yacht Club. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm a big star over here. That is a, I don't know who you think you're looking at up here, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm working the best place in Ravenswood. I'll have you know. I don't know. I think, and, I think uh, starring at a, at a uh, hardware store is pretty bad. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there. And then on the 22nd, that Saturday night, I'm at the Avon Legion doing a show out there opening for uh, Mike Armstrong. So, I, yeah, I still do. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite thing in the world to do is tell jokes. Yeah, got a conflict, sorry. Oh. What? Big one? Oh, okay. So, uh, anywho, but, um, yeah, I'm still telling out telling jokes and uh, working at the Legion and all that kind of thing. I hear the Legion's doing well under your guidance. Oh. <laughs> Thank well, you, there's... Chris. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, we it, when we got there uh, four years ago, it was about broke. But uh, we've uh, here's the thing is that I, when I had one-liners in Wilson's, I learned you know a little bit about running a bar restaurant, and so we've incorporated that in, into things out there. And we have uh, Texas Hold'em poker and a lot of other deals that going on. But uh, we've uh, tightened things up, and thanks to Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And this goes back before Roger Penske bought it, the Holman George family and Doug Bowles and all that were working to get us a road 
And then uh, we finally got that okayed with the town and uh, everything. And so there's going to be a road that will come in instead of that, the dead end of Georgetown where you can't get to us. We'll have an entrance, yeah, off of uh, Crawfordsville Road. And uh, so we're still working on naming that Legion Avenue and got a bunch of things to do there. But, the uh, yeah, I'm real proud of the job that our staff does there. Well, I, I got to know how difficult losing John was for you because you guys were together for a good number of years and you knew him very very well um, but uh, but on the other side of that as you have mentioned the number of people that kids particularly that he touched along the way and the number of guys that said geez maybe i should get checked and there's oh. lots of them so he's really touched an awful lot of people and you know andretti autosport's going to have um his decal, the hashtag, check it for Andretti on all their cars this year. Yeah. And Richard Petty is going to have uh, the uh, that on the 43 car down there. Because Richard and Richard Petty and John have always been tight. Uh, John told a story about one time. He was, he went, it was before he would no, it was, it was after he drove for Richard in the 43. And he was driving in some other car. And I forget who was driving the 43 at the time. But they got tangled up, and John stuck the 43 in the fence. So when the race was over, all of a sudden, he looks up, and here comes Richard Petty, big hat flopping in the air, headed for the hauler. You know, he was in there, and you could tell Richard was mad because John had crashed his car, and he comes in there, and he's looking at John, and he goes, yeah, yeah. How's Nancy and the kids? <laughs> John says, they're good, Richard. And he goes, Okay, all right, all right. Good talk. And then turn around and walk down. <laughs> Never said anything about John crashing his car. Well, this has been a very interesting evening, I think. The O'Gara gang and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you people are going to be surprised when you see this kid. Of course, you won't see him here, unfortunately, for another 10 years. Um, but a very intelligent young man. And watch the news tonight because they did, I think it was Channel 6, I believe. And interviewed him, and it was, I saw it earlier this afternoon, so it should be on the 11 o'clock news if you're still awake, which I probably won't be. And I thank Dave the King for being here. Thank you for listening. Always. Thanks for caring. Thank you. Don't forget tomorrow, you go online if you have the time, like Steve and I do, IndyCar.com, and there'll be live streaming of the uh, open test at COTA. Rain today. I was dumb enough to be sitting there. I screwed up my computer while I was there. I got to fix that tomorrow, but I, th I think it starts at 11:30 or something. So log on and watch it. It's kind of interesting what's going on there. I have some guests that have said they're available, but unfortunately, right now they're in Coda. I will check that out, and uh, we are going to do a, a, a piece for um, for Bill Simpson in the next week or two. I just heard from Jim Voyles today, and he may be in court, but we're going to do one for that. Because he was one special guy. I knew him for years, and somehow I got along with him. I'm not sure how, but I did. You know, f a few years ago when uh, when uh, Home and George family owned Channel 23, and we had, it was um, Vince Welch was in the pits, and uh, Donald Davidson and I was in the garage area, and we would do three hours live every day from the track from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So we were doing that, and the guy from mechanics uh, wear, to provide gloves and stuff for the mechanics and everything, it, it was chilly, and so he had given me a pair of gloves to wear. And so uh, I'm wearing them around the garage area. Well, anyway, he had me standing back in Gasoline Alley. Well, everybody, it was raining, it was cold, and I'm doing a report on something, and I have the mechanics gloves on. And Simpson was watching it on TV, and he saw me wearing these mechanics gloves. And the next thing I know, out of the corner of my eye, here comes Bill Simpson with a pair of his gloves. <laughs> Takes the gloves off my hands, puts these gloves on, and has never said a word. Just come up in the middle of the whole thing and just put uh, his gloves on me. <laughs> he was a character. Yes, he was. And as Jim will tell you, his opinion is a genius. We'll talk about him. Uh, that's upcoming. We've got some good things in the next few weeks, so uh, stick with us. Hopefully, I'll get my computer fixed so I can send out emails. Now I send out an email, and everything comes back to me. says I'm sending spam, and nobody will accept it. i got to figure out how to fix that, which Will has helped me with, as he does quite frequently.
Well, we'll be here next week, come hell or high water. It's going to be in the 50s, they say. We're going to freeze to death next day or two, but it's going to be in the 50s by Tuesday. So we'll see you then. Thanks, for everybody, for being here, Thank for you. listening, for watching. Until next week, Don K. saying good night. By the way, I want to remind you, if you haven't been to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, you got to go. It's the vault show. There's some really spectacular cars up there, so get out out there. See the Stinger. The Stinger, yes. Thanks.